us today and all these pages. It's a great blessing to see our folks assemble uh, for worship. We're glad that you're here today. And we'll, if, if a clear declaration from God's word makes you glad that you're here, you'll be glad. Uh, and so we, we want to try to do that. Because, of course, the words of the Lord are what we're going to face on the day of judgment. Not the words of a man or a group of men anywhere. And so we're glad that you're here. We're glad that uh, looking at so many faces, uh, I know we're of like uh, I wish you would uh, come with me to 1 John 2, 15 through 17 initially. You know, uh, preachers a lot of times will uh, just cloud up and run all over this world in this. And that's proper and good, but we need to come to find it. So we know what it is before asking people to avoid. And, uh, you know, there are some people that want to avoid things that are harmless. And we'll see that in a few moments. But it's set forth for us very clearly in the scriptures in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. The text says, Do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and also its lust. But to one who does the will of God, he lives forever. It's difficult, I believe, to find a more pertinent subject, a more important subject for us to lock down on than, than to examine the world in this. Because people are today distracted, and there's billions and billions of dollars being invested annually to keep folks distracted. And uh, you got to go here, you got to go there. Each of these places are going to make money by you go, but you go here, you go there, you buy this, you buy that, you need this, you need that, you need something else. And increasingly, I hear people saying, Well, I've got all that, and I'm miserable. And what is it? Well, a lot of this world is. Uh, the damage worldliness inflicts on individuals and families and communities is almost incalculable. It's also true uh, that this subject is important because people need to understand that the fleshly pleasures, the things the world offers, those things are fleeting. It's not going to last forever. And finally, it is true that the topic is, is important and vital. Because of the effectiveness of worldliness in diverting people and deceiving people and pulling them off away from the Lord's way. Scripture emphatically declares the love of the Father has no place in the heart of a worldly person. Now, that's a straight declaration from the text, James chapter 4 and verses 1 through 4. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not the uh, source of your pleasures? Is not that the source that wage war against your soul and in your members? You lust, he says, and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. So that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be the friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. To understand the subject, to grasp the subject, a careful distinction has to be made between morality and religion. Uh, these, these terms uh, just cannot be ignored if understanding is what we're after. And in drawing a distinction, we have to remember that moral law is natural, uh, resulting from creation, being created in the image of God. There is a sense of oughtness in every people on the face of this planet. Now, some of them uh, have different views of what that is, but they all have one. And there are things that they, that they feel are ennobling and things that are not. And so, we want to understand as we draw that distinction that there are those things in religious law. Uh, it came by revelation. 
And it's got to be learned. It's got to be taught. It's got to be learned. We're sending out a couple of young men. And uh, I hope that we've taught them. I know we've tried. And we've been there. And we will be there in the future. Uh, principles of moral law are the foundation of true religion. And since we're not under, since we're now under Christ, His law must direct us in all that we do. Uh, Colossians 3 verse 17 says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of by the authority of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. Religion differs from morality somewhat in valuations. Morality requires us to act on principle. The religion of Christ takes us even deeper than that into the state of one's heart and the, the attitude and the demeanor with which one uh, pursues his life. And so they, they differ in that way. The church in Ephesus, for example, from all appearances, sound in doctrine, commendable in zeal, what's to criticize? Model church. But he who understands the heart said of them, when he looked at them, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, but I have this against you, against them. What could you have against the Lord? You've left your first love. So the, the love of the Father and the love of the world are opposed to one another. And no one is acceptable to God who allows the world to have first place in his heart. The things of the world, the mundane pedestrian concerns that we have, all those responsibilities people do have. And so that needs to be met, must be met. And yet we cannot afford to give that first place. We're told in Matthew 6, verse 33, Jesus preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. It's a fundamental rule that we want to consider. It's difficult to define the boundaries of worldliness because ignorance and bigotry brand some things as worldly that are harmless. Romans chapter 14 comes to mind. They, they are in the midst of a significant brouhaha over whether or not you can eat meat that was sold uh, in the market, that some of it went to idols, or uh, you, you could secure that meat, whether that you could eat. Paul, you know, talks about the fact, well, it's one way or the other, but don't offend brethren, don't cause anybody to lose their soul over it. But we all know that it's harmless. So carelessness and laxity on the other extreme, you have people that have scruples about virtually everything. At the other end of the extremism spectrum, you have this laxity that permits many things that are by no means innocent. Uh, if you ever have a chance to go to one of these water parks or uh, go out to a beach, uh, I'm going to tell you what, there are a lot of people out there that I don't know how you could get less clothes on than what they have. Uh, they, they just won't be naked. And, uh, and so they see that as innocent, apparently, because they do it, but it's not, that's not innocent. But that's not the way people should comport themselves and profess to be Christian. Uh, in modesty, in, in our dress, in modesty, in our attitude, or what's called social drinking, is, you know, that's, that's permitted. I heard a gospel preacher say a couple, three years ago, I'm going to tell you, doing it wrong, you drink a glass of wine with your meal. Well, I don't know exactly how much alcohol you got to swallow, but I know this. That there's a lot of dead children on these roadsides that somebody ran over and killed because of that use. I mean, you can just see that Sunday night. So uh, it's hard to get an absolute definition, okay, this is worldly and that is not. The question is never going to be settled on the basis of opinion. According to the standard of opinion, we would be continually approving this and disapproving of that. We'd end up all over the place, which is no place, and that's what you call chaos. That's where you'd end up. 
So the way to gain certainty is to determine the principles that govern the issues that we confront and always act on the basis of those principles. What does the term world mean? You talk about worldly and use the word world. What are you talking about? Because the Bible uses it in a number of ways. We'll, we'll look at four of the primary uses. The term occurs, of course, a lot of times. And the meaning is not always the same in every context. For example, James 4 and verse 4. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. 1 John 2, 15 and 16, do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. Uh, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the most pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. We got that, right? Then you go to John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, now, which is it? So it's obvious from these three passages that the word world has two distinct meanings. And so we're going to look at four common uh, ways, senses in which the term is used. The term world or earth is used in the sense of the creation of the whole universe. John 17, verse 5, Now the Father, now Father glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you, before the world was. He's not talking exclusively about Earth. He's talking about the cosmos. Uh, and that's certainly not the forbidden world. He's not talking about the forbidden world of 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Uh, you go over to Psalm 19 and begin to read there. The heavens are telling the glory of God and their expanses declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, as the sun coming forth every morning. And he rejoices as a strong man to run his course. And its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to another end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. And so you have the word world. You see him there talking about all this vast expanse. And that's the world as it's used in that kind of context. Then you have the term earth used or world used to denote the single planet, little blue planet on the outskirts of a, uh, you know, fairly typical galaxy, not one of the really big ones, uh, in what's called the Goldilocks zone, and we're thankful for that. And, and so it's used to describe that sometimes, Mark 16 and 15. When the commission is given, and Mark's rendition of that, he said, and then go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And so this is part of God's creation. Of course, it is not the forbidden world of our text. You see that, right? There's a forbidden world, but this is not it. Different uses, different contexts. The earth is used to designate the inhabitants of the earth, that is, men and women everywhere, apart from their habits, apart from their character, just their existence. Humanity in the aggregate. Uh, this cannot be the forbidden world when he says, don't love that. Because we've got to love what God loves. And so, you cannot be talking about the forbidden world that John introduced. Uh, because God loves this place, these people who make up the world. Matthew 5, 43 to 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's a tough, that's a heavy lift if you're a weak human like I am. But he said, so that you may be the sons and daughters of your father who is in heaven, for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, 
and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So that, that world, and then you saw that, that's humanity. He said, my people are to love them, because I love them. The term earth is used too, the last one, the fourth one, to denote worldly affairs, worldly endowments and accoutrements, riches, advantages, pleasures, and so on, which these things stir desire. And when they stir desire, they have great power to seduce people away from God and they are obstacles to the cause of Christ. I do not know. I have no idea how many brethren have gone out the back door that we talked and baptized into Christ and they went along for a while with the Lord and the next thing you know, you start to see less and less and less and then you're in the wind. Why? What happened? Well, so many times they got and many times not horrific, terrible things, but they got involved in this, that, or whatever the community offers, and they placed more significance on that than they did to the cause of Christ, and they were lost to the Christ. Some of them lost their children to those things. That's not a comfortable thing to talk about, but it is the truth, my brethren. As I stand here before you, it's the truth, and I'll stand and, and declare the truth as long as I live. I hope. So the earth is used to denote those things. And that's what the text forbids. In Matthew 16 and verse 26, For what would it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul, or forfeit his soul, the New King James says, I mean the New American Standard, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Some people will, will give up their soul for not much. That's what we're trying to lay the groundwork to convince people don't do that. If you're doing it quick, it's the time to think through those things is now. Because it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. We talked about that, that exit from here. I mean, you are going to be how you leave here. That's what will be judged. There's not a redo, there's not a do over, one time through. The dominant conception of worldliness is much too narrow. I need to point that out. Of uh, the view that worldliness is, is used, uh, the view of worldliness, I should say, is typically restricted to material things rather than spiritual things. Uh, the surface rather than the fundamentals. A broadly held, uh, held view of worldliness is that it consists largely in participating in popular entertainments and amusement. amusement. What are you talking about? Dancing, drinking, and gambling. That's what I'm talking about. Right out here at the casino. Uh, while these things are hurtful, if that's one's total view of worldliness, it's too narrow. There's, there, those things have a deleterious effect in society. Yes, they do. But the, that's not all of them. One would like to believe that every recently well-informed and fair-minded person is fully aware of the evil tendencies of those indulgences, dash, drink, and gambling, and the shipwreck that it will make of character, because that often results. Uh, gambling, you know, there, there's a close kinship between cards, dice, slot machines, and gambling addiction. I grew up in a gambling community. In a dry state, they sold liquor and they had all of those things in Biloxi, Mississippi. Now I know what it does. Uh, two, how demoralizing is the spirit of covetousness that is generally generated in numerous games of chance? It's designed to make you cut. The Nostella Casino was sold to the public on the idea that it's going to be a great boom to local economy. I mean, the whole region, the dawn of the age of Aquarius. Where's the money? They said they're going to build a big, you know, they're going to go big, big time with it. Bank is stopping there. And they brought it with. Where's the money? Anybody catch the check? You know, 
You look at our children, and the last account I had, 70% qualified to have their breakfast and lunch provided by the public. Not wealthy here. I don't know if it's any better than that today. And I ask, you know, when will the dawning of this near universal prosperity, when will it come? And so you look at the negative effects that it has. Well, drinking, you know, multiplied thousands of people are killed in this country every year because somebody thought that they needed to drink it behind the wheel. And not to mention those that are lost to fentanyl, uh, methamphetamines, and other drugs. No reasonably rational person can argue that the, the net result of chemical abuse provides a net good for society. Presumably, we would not tolerate those kinds of losses if they were imposed by some enemy force that came ashore down here at Galveston and started to inflict that kind of death and destruction. Uh, every Dear Hunter in Polk County would be down there meeting them on the beach. Well, let's get to the one that brethren struggled with dancing. Let's be honest. You spend a lot of each other with yourself. Those who adore the modern dance find themselves on the road to perilous drift. There is a lure in the dance. There's a subtle influence to evil for some and overwhelming to others. And I would say without uh, fear of being contradicted uh, that any young man that can hold a woman like that and keep his mind where it ought to be is to go to see dog. And so those are, those are things that have a bad effect to make it. If one will follow the Spirit in the teaching of 2 Corinthians 5, verses 9 and 10. He will have a little difficulty deciding what's the best course to take when facing those questions. Therefore, therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may be recompensed for his deeds done in the body according to what he has done, whether it's good or bad. So with these indisputable facts before us, it must still be apparent that worldliness is not merely participating in dancing, drinking, and gambling. I'm not defending that. I'm just saying that's not all there is to it. There are many, many who've never danced a step who do not want to know one card from another, who are in love with the things of the world. Philippians 3, beginning in verse 17, Brother Paul writes, Brethren, join in following my example. Observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I have often told you, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is their shame who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also are eagerly awaiting the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there it is. Matthew 16 and 23, but he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, because you are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind Watch it, not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. That's worldliness. It have anything to do with the things we've just enumerated. Colossians 3 and verse 2, set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. What is then essential worldliness? Worldliness does not consist solely in doing certain things or being in certain places. That's not all of it. It is an attitude. It is a view of life. It is a, a foreign state of mind. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul is there writing. He says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living 
holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. One may find himself in the most worldly atmosphere and yet not feel at home and inwardly revolting against what he's being exposed to and anxious to get away from it. You can find yourself that kind of our sleep you may be in a thoroughly spiritual atmosphere in a church building in a worship assembly and yet not be in harmony with the spirit of the occasion but far away in mind and in spirit. According to the scripture, worldliness consists in three primary states of being. Uh, the first is the lust of the flesh. In Romans chapter 5 verses 8 and 9, the great Apostles of Gentiles wrote, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. In Galatians chapter 5, pick it up at verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the same, uh, for the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Uh, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh, he gets on now and gets specific. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. Now, he said those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. The lust of the flesh. You can't do what you want to do. You know, there, somebody might have made you angry and you might have wanted to hit him right on the end of the nose. Just because you're mad. You can't do that. You know, people a lot of times say, well, I should have said this or something. No, you shouldn't. I don't need to buy that. No, you shouldn't. It's good that you did. You did the right thing. If you keep your mouth shut, you did the right thing. And then right. Lust of flesh. Lust of flesh. The lust of the eyes. The desire is excited by sin. Now, that is especially true of men. John chapter, in women all of them. John chapter 7, 20 and 21, so I could answer Joshua and said, Truly I sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw, when I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold 50 shekels weight, then I covered them and took them, and behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent, with silver underneath. And so he was overwhelmed by what he saw. It, it led him away from God. Matthew 5, 27. He says, You've heard that it was said you shall not have committed adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That's worldliness. If she don't belong to you, you keep your hands off of her, and, and uh, if you keep your mind off of her, God help you do that. The vain glory of life. That's another manifestation. Primary manifestation of the world. 
The term vainglory means that, uh, refers to an insolent, an insolent, empty assurance which trusts in its own power and its own resources and shamelessly despises and violates divine laws and human rights. It is an impious and empty presumption that trusts in the stability of earthly things. We've just seen a little sample of what a mistake that is happening. We haven't seen this kind of rain lately. Uh, and people have had great loss. But things do not stay the same in this world. They never have. In James chapter 4, verse 16, but as it is, he said, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. The term indicates a display of one style of living. All types of sin were exemplified when the devil tempted Mother Eve in Genesis 3, 1 to 6. I mean, there's lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and the boss of pride of life. It was there. And you go to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and Jesus faced down the devil. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the boss of pride of life. There it is. It is a view that one may hold quite apart from the environments where the rich or poor learn or irreligious or learn, whether inside the church or outside of it. It is spiritually lethal, but sadly it is widely practiced among men and women. I mean, he meant one needs to recognize the different types of worldlings. There's the absolutes of the world. Second Samuel 15 and verse 1 began. He brazenly undermined his father David and stole away the hearts of the people. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5, 15 and verse 6, people coming to, to be judged of the king, and he intercepted. Oh, I do this and I do that and I do something else. Uh, in the same manner, in this manner, Absalom dealt with all Israel who came, came for judgment. So Absalom stole away the hearts of the men of Israel. This man was for himself, first, second, always. And ultimately, leading a rebellion to overthrow his own father, who was effectively governing God's people. Then you look at the foolish rich man. That's a different kind of a world. In chapter 12 of Luke, verses 15 to 21, there's no indication that that man was vicious. There's no indication that he was a, a crook, that he practiced malfeasance in his business, none whatsoever, or obtained his wealth at any dishonorable means. But still, he was worldly. Why? He lived only for time. He lived only for this world. Then there is uh, there are church members who seek the praise of men. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, Jesus is talking about that. And he said, you know, you need to be aware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet and do not uh, before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored. Truly I say to you that they have a reward in full, but when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what the right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Jesus called the worldly church people, members, hypocrites, and he denounced that kind of behavior vigorously. Their conduct was an embarrassment to the Lord, and in matters, uh, it's not only what you do, but it's why you do it and how you do it, the spirit from which it comes. Now, this sort of worldly is the most harmful, I would say, for religiously to regard men more than the will of God. In John 12, 42 and 43, he says, Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him, but watch, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. Why did they put the Pharisees out of the synagogue? When they stand up and say, I'm not going anywhere. You may be going. And so there you have that, that kind of worldly. And he's more harmful than Absalom. Everybody that, that kept looking at Absalom, they figured that out fine. But th this hypocrite abuses religion and the titles of religion and the organs of religion and makes a mockery of it. Worldliness is forbidden for good reason. 
couple of good reasons. It's incompatible with the love of God. It's forbidden because the world and its lust are transitory. Worldliness is forbidden because of the permanence. That's what the Christians do. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this to visit the Father and support us in their affliction to keep oneself in the spot of the world. 1 Corinthians 15 and 58. Uh, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That's people that we're saying. Worldliness is state of mind. Character cannot be rightly judged by isolated deeds, good or bad. It is the trend of one's life that determines his destiny. And when men and women are engrossed by material things of life, dominated by them, then however punctual they might be in their formal religion, they're worth Those who, despite manifold mistakes, still reckon with God and take seriously the teachings of Jesus, they're spiritual. What are you today? It may be that there's someone here that's not in Christ, and you know you need to be. We don't do that. We, we can make it all fit today with all of our activities. If you believe Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of the very God, and have not indicated that by manifesting penitence and confessing His name, come do that. Then consent to be buried with Him in baptism for remission of sins. Come now. Come now.